Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath to everyone. Do you think it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. Amen. I do too. I'm glad that I'm here today, and I'm glad that you're here today, and I know that the Lord has something special in mind. I, I want to tell you that today I have entitled um, the message, it's, it's a different kind of a message for me. There we go. It's a different kind of a message for me. It's called Seasons Change. And I have entitled it that for a, a specific reason. And, and I'm going to give a little kind of a different sermon today. This is not going to be a polished sermon. It is going to be um, just me sharing with you from the Word some things that I believe are very important. Okay, so um, why don't we begin with a word of prayer and we'll proceed. Father... I want to thank you for the privilege of being able to gather here with brothers and sisters today to worship you. It's a beautiful, gorgeous day outside, and we thank you for that. And we pray, Lord, that as we get into your word and we consider what you're saying to us, that you will encourage our hearts and strengthen our faith this morning. We ask your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. So when I think about seasons and seasons changing, I think about a lot of different things. I mean, everything from, you know, spring, summer, fall, and winter to, you know, your birthdays. Every year you, you have a birthday and it's a different season. I can remember how grown up I thought I was when I finally became a teenager because I, it was a new season, right? And you know, every, every year we have the new year and it's a new season. Every, every April we have a new tax season. There's always a new season that's coming. But I'm wondering about your life. And I'm thinking about my life too. And I'm wondering how the season is that you're in right now. What is the season of life that you're going through? What is it that God has for you? And I, I'm going to be very honest, and, and, and some of you have heard me say this during prayer meeting, so I, I guess for you it'll be a little redundant. But I'm going to be very honest and tell you that in 2018 so far, this has been an extremely extremely tough season for my family. Um, it's just hard. It's been a, been a hard uh, year so far. Maybe some of you can relate. Maybe, maybe it's been hard for you. Um, so I've been thinking about seasons and I, I, I keep thinking surely Surely this one can't just keep going. It, it can't just keep going, can it, God? Surely you're going to bring some change so that I'm not stuck in heartbreak and I'm not stuck in struggle. I'm not stuck in trial. I'm not just stuck in a rough, tough season. You've felt that way, I assume, before. <coughs> Haven't you? Maybe you're feeling that way now. If you brought your Bible today, would you say amen? amen? Good. Will you open it with me then to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes is just after Psalms and Proverbs. <coughs> Ecclesiastes chapter 3. When you're there, would you please say amen? amen? All right. So, I'm going to read just the first verse to begin with. Okay? In the first verse, 
it says, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. To everything there is a season. Okay? So, first of all, I want to point out that season means an appointed time. It means like a decreed um, space of time. It's not just like a, a happenstance time frame. It's an appointed time. So a season, it, God says there's a season for how many things? For everything, okay? To everything there is a season. And then let's go back. It says a, a time for every purpose under heaven. And that time is also, it's indicative of a period of time, like a, a space of time, not just a day, but a, a season, a period of time. So one other thing that stands out to me from verse 1 is that it says that there is a time for every what? Every purpose under heaven. But did you know that that same exact Hebrew term that is translated purpose is translated elsewhere as pleasure? It is, there is a time for every purpose and pleasure under the sun. And things don't just happen randomly. And I'm going to be honest with you. When I think about what's been going on in, in my personal life and in my family and stuff, I'm thinking, and I talk to God about this very plainly, I'm thinking, okay, God, we've had ours for a while. Isn't it time, you know, for a change of season? And I know God's big enough to handle my reasoning. But I don't think like he does, right? My thoughts are not his thoughts, my ways, his. But it sure seems to me like it's time for a new season. So I'm praying for it. I'm really praying for it. But I want to read through some of Ecclesiastes 3, and then we're going to turn our attention to Isaiah. Okay? So let's go ahead and begin in verse 2 here. It says, There is a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to gain and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to fear, excuse me, a time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. You'll notice, of course, as you read these, that all of these things that he's saying there's a time for, they're diametrically opposed, right? A time to be born and a time to die, right? A time to, for war, a time for peace. They're opposite ends of the spectrum. But there is a time, an appointed time, a season for all of these things that happen through life. And that tells me something. That tells me that God is in charge of what is going on. I said God is in charge of what is going on. Some of you might be thinking, well... You must not realize what's going on in my family then. 
but God is in charge of what is happening with all of us. Amen? He really is. Now, we, many, many times, <laughs> we are not cooperative with what God has in mind. How many times has God been doing something that you do not understand what he's doing? How many times do you think, God, you're late? Right? How many times do you find yourself feeling like you, you know for sure, you, you know for sure that you're praying exactly would, it would be God's will. So why in the world is he not doing it? Yes? You ever have these thoughts, these feelings? Okay, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to think with you and reason with you through scripture and experience so that we can bring scripture into our real life. That's all I'm trying to do today. What I do know is that God has a time and a season that he appoints for different things in our lives. It's not good to get out in front of God. It's not good to stay behind and not heed his voice and not follow, right? All right. Now, here's what I want to get to next. Let's go to... Um, staying right here in Ecclesiastes 3, let's look at verse 11. Verse 11 says, He has made how many things? Everything beautiful in its time. Also, He has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God has done from beginning to end. Oh, this verse I have wrestled with some. He has put eternity in their hearts. How many of you hope to survive? I think that was everybody. How many of you would like to have everlasting life? Amen. God has put eternity in our hearts, right? In fact, people tend to fight for their lives. Okay, so the other thing is, I'm glad Randy's got this up on the screen or whoever's up there. Thank you. Um, set to, turn, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. Okay, so the KJV is worded just slightly differently than the NKJV. And so I'm going to look back at mine so I can get my track of thought again. He has made everything beautiful in his time. He's put eternity in their hearts. Oh, yeah. No one can find out the work. That's what I wanted to emphasize on. No one can find out the work that he has done from beginning to end. So let me ask you this. Have you ever tried to, like, understand really, really understand what God is doing and you just you just don't get it at all not at all listen there's a reason he tells us in his word that his ways are not our ways remember how we talked about not, not that long ago the fact that God always has the end game in mind that God is always working with the, the eternal things in mind but you and I, we get so caught up with temporal things, what's going on in our own experience right here, right now, that we become myopic and we only see what's right in front of us. While God, God is experiencing, and not just experiencing, He's controlling all kinds of things that are happening because He's working in your life, He's working in your life, He's working in my life, He's working in your life, He's working in all your lives at the same time. And while He's doing that, He's got eternity in mind for each one of us. You realize that, right? 
And you and I, we get stuck in some experience that we're experiencing right now that is heavy on us, that we're burdened by, that we're overwhelmed by, that we feel out of control about, that we don't understand what God is doing, and we're very frustrated, but we only see myopically what's just right in front of us. God sees everything. It's like if you were, have you ever been to the ocean? Okay, how many of you have been to the ocean? Okay, the ocean is a pretty amazing experience, really. So I've been on the ocean, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about when I was in Hawaii. So I'm on the ocean in Hawaii, and the waters were very, I mean, it just almost didn't even seem like it changed when I walk into the water. I was just wet. It was so warm. And it was, it was clear and beautiful. And the waves were crashing. And, and I was having this experience of, of God. Because he created all this, right? So I was having this experience of God. Look what God has done. And I realized later, you know, I'm on this little slice of this tiny island in a great big globe. And I'm thinking... Even if I was just to say that my experience with God is like me on that beach when God is actually the whole world, that would be an understatement because he's created worlds and worlds and universes. Right? So to understand him, it would be preposterous to think that a finite mind could truly understand God. He shows us glimpses and reveals himself to us. And we're awed by small things he reveals to us. But throughout eternity, we're going to be learning about this amazing God who is infinite. That's, do you know why I'm talking about all this? I am talking about all this because I'm trying to tell you that what you're going through in your life, it is for a season. And that the God who has created you and redeemed you and loves you with an everlasting love, he is still sovereign on his throne. And I'm sorry to tell you, but there's going to be many, many times that you do not get what he's doing or you don't understand his timing or anything. But we must believe that he's got our best interest at heart. And that he's always working for our eternal good. Amen? Amen? All right. Now that I've said all that, I want to turn over to Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61. Before I read, I want to tell you something that, uh, I don't know, it's, it's very personal, but at the same time, I, I want to hopefully connect with you and let me just say this. I have been, I've decided I'm going to be like the persistent friend. You know the parable, right? You keep knocking at the door, knocking at the door. Go away. We're in bed. The kids are in bed. Knock at the door. Go away. It's late. Finally, open the door and give you what you're asking for, right? I've decided I'm going to be the persistent friend, and I'm going to tell you something. I am praying for, I am praying for jubilee in my life, in my family. I'm praying for Jubilee. Isaiah 61. If you're there, would you please say amen? All right, beginning in verse 1. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. I want to pause right there and ask you, what is this talking about? What is this verse talking about? Somebody just speak it out.
Come on, don't be shy. What is it talking about? It is. It's talking about Christ's ministry. It's what he came to do. It's his mission statement, basically, right? This describes the ministry of Christ. Remember when he took up the scroll of Isaiah in the temple, it was this that he opened to and he read. And as he read it about himself, then he gave the scroll back and he said, today this is fulfilled in your hearing, right? That's the passage right there. Right there. I'm looking at that one. So, what I want you to realize is the things that he came to do. He came to preach good tidings to the poor. <laughs> Listen, poor here is not just for the people who have a lack of money. In fact, it is more so pointed at the people that Jesus was talking to on his Sermon on the Mount. When he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Meaning what? Poor in spirit. And if blessed means happy, why are they happy if they're poor in spirit? Poor in spirit means they recognize their own sinful condition. They realize their spiritual poverty. They're bankrupt. They know they got nothing good to offer. They do not trust in their own works to save them. They realize their lack of righteousness. Jesus says that they are happy. They're blessed. You know, because you must realize, and I must realize, that I can't bring enough good to the table ever to save myself. A lot of people believe that if the good outweighs the bad when you're done, then you're in. Uh-uh. That's a program of works. What it is, is do you have Christ standing as your atonement for sin? Have you trusted in Him and not, in His righteousness, not yours? That's what makes the difference, right? It is. So let's, let's move on and see what he's saying. He, he came to preach good tidings to the poor. That's good news, right? That it's not about if you can do good enough and be perfect. No, it's that he has done good enough and is perfect and will represent you. That's good news. Secondly, he sent me to heal the brokenhearted. I want to ask you, how many of you have ever been brokenhearted? How many... How many broken-hearted people do you think are in our community? Jesus is saying that he came to heal the broken-hearted. I'll tell you what. I need him to keep working in me, on my heart. I, I've suffered my share of heartbreak even this calendar year. At least I keep claiming it's my share. I keep claiming we're done. We're moving into a new season. It goes on and it says, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to those who are bound. You ever been in bondage before? You ever had a habit you can't break? You ever been held captive by your own fears or inhibitions or by lies? He came to set us free from the things that hold us captive. It's a great mission, what he's got. It benefits us immensely. You, you can't put a price tag on it. I'm going to keep going down here. In verse 2, it says, To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. I want to ask you, first of all, what is the acceptable day of the Lord? 
<laughs> the acceptable day of the Lord, friends, as it is used in this context, is the year of Jubilee. It is Jubilee. Do you know what happens in Jubilee? Listen, you got 49 years, 49 years of life going on with all its trouble and hardships and burdens and everything like that. But the 50th year, the 50th year is the year of Jubilee. In the year of Jubilee, if things were tough for you and you had to sell off your property, guess what? You get it back. You get it back. If you have fallen on hard times and you are over your head in debt, it's wiped out. You no longer have debt. If you had things go horribly and you were become a slave to someone else, you were freed. It was the year of jubilee. What do you think about when you, when you say someone is jubilant, what does that mean? Yeah, they're definitely joyous. And that comes from Jubilee because you can imagine people were very joyous when they were getting their property back, when they were getting their freedom back, when, they were, when their debt was wiped out. Right? Come on, church, are you with me? So listen, I, I'm thinking about all the things in, in my life. You know, the way that that the devil has pulled us in, uh, into certain kinds of captivity or bondage. The way that, that he's caused us to feel like we owe so much that we can never pay. It's insurmountable. The way that he has knocked people, even in my own family, out of their positions, as it were, and they do not feel like they can get back. Listen. This is why I'm praying for the year of Jubilee. We need God to speak restoration in our family. How about you? You know, sometimes it's not easy getting up here and just being vulnerable and telling you what I really got on my heart and on my mind. But I'm going to tell you something. I, I, I don't know about you. I don't know where you stand. But I am all done with pretense. I am way past pretense. It is time to be authentic with the Lord Jesus. Right? And we as a people ought to be authentic before Him. We ought to be... You know, really taking strong consideration of what he says in his word and what it means for our real lives. All right. Also, the second part of verse 2 talks about God. It says, the day of vengeance of our God. To, <laughs> the day of vengeance of our God. And why, is, why, is the day of, why does it mention the day of vengeance? What does it say right after that? To comfort all those who mourn. Have you ever wished that someone would get their due? Oh, I wish that, I wish that guy would just get his butt kicked one time. He has been so nasty to so many people. You ever wish that? I'm not saying, oh, I wish I could kick that guy's butt right now. <laughs> no, listen, what I am saying is this. Vengeance is not ours, is it? Vengeance belongs to the Lord. Now, I do want to say this. God doesn't expect us to turn away from what is obviously wrong and not step in. Listen, in Proverbs it says that God hates hands that shed innocent blood, doesn't it? You can then make the deduction 
that God loves hands that protect the innocent. Amen? I don't think that's a stretch. But I will say that God is going to come and finally set things right. Maybe you've been really wronged by people. Maybe somebody has really, really done you wrong. And I'm not just trying to get you to dwell on that because we don't want to consume ourselves with that person that really bothers me or whatever. That's not a good way to think. But I will say this. Where you have been done wrong, God will see that it's made right. Even the worst wrongs. And we know some abuses and stuff have been atrocious. But God will set things right. I'm going to point out something. This right here that we're reading about in verses 1 and 2 is the mission of Jesus Christ for His people. You recognize that? He is saying, I've come to heal your broken heart. I've come to release you from captivity. I have come to give you... It's, it's time for the year of Jubilee. He is coming to give you abundant life. And I don't know about you, but I don't just want to read about abundant life in the Bible and know what it says there. I want to live abundant life. Verse 3. To console those who mourn in Zion. To give them beauty for ashes, the, the joy, excuse me, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. <clears throat> Listen, do you realize that mourning in the east is different than mourning in the west? Here, when we think about mourning, we think about, you know, Maybe people crying and, and talking about their grief a little bit and so forth. In the East, mourning is, is a great big deal. That, I mean, they hire mourners to cry out, oh, to call it out, shout it out. They're mourning. And he came to console those who mourn and to give them beauty for ashes. Do you know that be word beauty right there in the Hebrew is translated literally as headdress? Headdress or garland? Something that would be placed on the head? Because guess what? In those times when you were a Hebrew and you were truly mourning because maybe you lost somebody you love, maybe some great calamity fell on you or your family, when people were mourning, they would put on sackcloth and what? Ashes. Meaning they literally would put on these garments for mourning that were tattered and torn and they would put on ashes. They'd take ashes and pour it over their head, rub it on their face. They would put on those things to demonstrate that I am feeling very, very downcast. This is powerful for me. I'm mourning. But he's saying... I'll give you beauty for ashes. You're, you're going to exchange the ashes for this beautiful crown that I have for you. Because we're going to indicate here that the mourning is over. Okay? Also, where it says um, the oil of joy for mourning, because while they were mourning, you realize that they don't use oil. They don't, they don't ever use oil when they're in, the, in their period of, of mourning. So if they get the oil of joy, that means that the mourning is over. Put away your sorrows. You got the oil back. And listen, people used oil differently than we think about oil simply for like anointing these days. But they would use oil to make their, fra their face look fresh and alive and vibrant. Put away that stuff. Put away your sorrows. 
And listen, I know I'm, we're, we're looking at Hebrew culture, but we need to make the connection for us today. What is God saying to us? You can put away your sorrows. I have for you the oil of joy. Look at the next one. It says the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Have you ever felt like the weight of the world was on your shoulders? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, you're so burdened. It almost feels like you have to walk like this. Right? Just you feel so heavy. But he's saying he's going to exchange that out and give you the garment of praise. Notice that the next part, it says that, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Think about a tree that God planted. A tree that God planted would be one that grows up straight and strong, right? Straight and strong. And as it's planted there, it's going to begin to flourish with its foliage. And it's also going to produce fruit. God has come to make a powerful difference in our lives. Listen, we're not supposed to just be oppressed and beaten down and downcast and stuck where we are. We're not, folks. The Bible says that we are more than conquerors. Isn't that right? Oh, come on, that's so weak. Yep, that's what it said. <laughs> are, we, are we more than conquerors? Do you believe what the Word of God says? I do. Sometimes I'm challenged by it, though, if I'm honest. Sometimes it challenges me. You realize when I make statements, when I, when I ask questions like that, that get right up in your grill, do you believe what the Word of God says? You realize I'm already asking myself that question, right? What I'm trying to get you to see is that there is a season that God came to bring us into that is called Jubilee. I don't know about you, but I need Jubilee in my life and in my family. It says here in verse 4, And they shall rebuild the old ruins, and they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. Listen, when Le Nehemiah was released to go back to the cities for the purpose of rebuilding it, when he got there to Jerusalem, it was laid waste. Everything was in ruins. You could see, you could see some parts of foundations of different things that were still there. You could see the ruins that something used to really be there that meant something. But right now, it was all in shambles. But God says, they shall raise up the former def desolations, rebuild the old ruins, repair the ruined cities. I'm going to tell you something. I've been meeting with someone, and as I have, we've talked about looking at our families and our, and, and our lives and stuff. And, and this person shared with me that they've made many, many mistakes. Can you imagine that? I know you can. But this person is talking about mistakes, choices. Not just oops, but, you know, I made a bad choice and I blew it. Choices that have caused big problems in the family. Now, the person looks back over the family and thinks, wow. Look, look at the devastation that is in my, my children and in my spouse from the choices that I've made. Some, some of you, if not all of you, can look upon your family and you can remember, you might see remnants of what was. I remember when the kids were little and how things were really good then. And we were always in Sabbath school. And they were so, they were having so much joy all the time. And just good kids. 
and now they're, they're there, but it's like they're a shell of what they're supposed to be. Or maybe it's that way toward the parents. Maybe the kids remember what dad or mom used to be like. You know what I'm saying? Do we know what brokenness is? In the church, do we know what brokenness is? Man, I'm going to assume by your silence that you mean yes. What I know is that I serve a living God who is fully capable of restoring everything that's been broken down. And I want it. Maybe you think, Pastor, I don't even have to look at my family. I just look at my own life and I see ruins. God is in the business of rebuilding and restoring what ought to be. What time is it? It's about noon? Yes, straight right. noon. Verse 5 says, strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. And the sons of the foreigners shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. <laughs> strangers, maybe they were once enemies. And now, they're friends, they're working with you. They're supportive. You know, God... God can turn things around radically. I'm going to get one more verse here for sure. Maybe a few. Let's go to verse 6. Verse 6 says, But you shall be named what? The priests of the Lord. They shall call you the servants of our God, and you shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory you shall boast. You shall be named priests, like the tribe of Aaron. You shall be named priests. After all, if you are a new creation, like it talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says that you are an ambassador for Christ, doesn't it? That you have been given the ministry of reconciliation, right? So it is the priesthood of all believers. You are, and so that means that you have a major task. That means that your task is to represent to the world what Jesus is like and to bring people to a saving knowledge of Jesus. That is our job as his priests. Man, that's a big task, right? Bring people to a saving knowledge of Jesus? How are you going to do that? Listen, how any of us are going to do it is we're first of all going to experience the ministry of Christ in our own lives, being brought out of bondage, having our brokenness healed coming into a newness of life with him. And as we experience that, we help other people to realize that they can too. All right, I'm going to move on to verse 7. Verse 7 says, Instead of your shame, you shall have double honor. And instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess double. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. You know what this makes me think of? It makes me think of Job. Job was the richest man in the East. And he lost how much? Everything. Not only did he lose everything that he owned, all of his riches, but then he lost all of his children. And then he lost his health. And he had boils, painful, pus-filled boils from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. Lost everything. No one could comfort him. 
Even his wife ended up saying, why don't you just curse God and die? I, I think it was more of a, maybe a mindset of, man, just get it over with. This is horrible. But he never, never questioned God's character. He questioned why he had to go through what he was going through. But he never questioned God's character. He said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, everything that happens to us in this life, when it's all going good, we might be quick to say, man, God is sure good. And then when it all starts going bad, we look, like, look to God like, what in the world's going on? I thought you were supposed to be good. And he is good. He's good whether what's happening with us is easy or difficult. Isn't that right? He is the same God. He is always the same God. That is exactly why I love him and I'm learning to trust him. Because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I can depend on him. Everything else and everyone else in my life changes. But God is the constant that I can always rely on. So Job lost everything. And was that the end of the story? No, he actually had things restored to him, didn't he? But he got double. He was already the richest man before the calamity struck, but then when he was restored, he got double, didn't he? You might feel, you might feel like you are under great affliction. You already know that I have felt like I've suffered quite a bit of affliction this year. Lots of different ways, too. Doesn't seem to just be one avenue. Coming from front and behind. You know what I'm saying? All sides. But God is going to change that affliction so that what feels like Shame and struggle is, is turned into rejoicing and a double portion of blessing. And you know what? I keep praying that prayer. I don't know if God's getting sick of me yet. I, I, I hope not. But I, I keep praying that prayer. I am calling on you for jubilee in my family, Lord. We need a new season. A season of blessing. I'm going to tell you how bold I am with my prayer. Because it says that we should come boldly to the throne of grace, right? Right? So I am, I am so bold in my prayer that I'm praying like this. I'm praying, Lord, make your b blessing in my family so pronounced that anyone can tell that we have been blessed by you. Make it, make it a witness for you that we can speak of your glory and, and people will wonder what happened with this family because your hand of blessing is so powerful on us. I'm praying for jubilee, God. Not like I'm worthy of, but like you're worthy of. I'm going to Skip down to verse 9. Verse 9 says, Their descendants shall be known among the Gentiles and their offspring among the people. All who see them shall acknowledge them, that they are the posterity whom the Lord has blessed. And I'm saying, yep, Lord. That's going to be my family because of your goodness. My children and my grandchildren. And if they grow up and have children, their children too. That they will be known, recognized as your posterity. 
that people will know them and think of them favorably and realize, you know what? Those people right there, they're the people of God. It's not outrageous to pray like this. You know why? Because I am praying according to the word of God. That's why it's not outrageous. It feels kind of outrageous in a way. But I realize that my God is not the God of small things. He's still the God of miracles that led the Israelites through the Red Sea out of Egypt. Anyway, I'm going to close. I want you to think a little bit about your own life. What, what season is it? What are you going through? What's, what's happening with you? Is it a season where you're looking for God to breathe more life into it because it's been a dry drought season? Is it a season where you have been living in conflict and you're ready for peace? It is, is it a season where you have known constant work and restless nights and struggle and strife and you're waiting for a reprieve and a refreshing from the Lord? Because if it is, I want to invite you to join me in praying for Jubilee. Jubilee for your family. Jubilee for your own life. Jubilee for our church. I need Jubilee. How about you, church? Let's pray, shall we? Father, you know every one of us and you know the struggles that we face. Oh Lord, we're not trying to overlook the ways in which you have always taken care of us and been faithful to us. You've been so good. You really have. We have many blessings that we always know that we should pay attention to and give you praise and thanks for. We recognize that. But Lord, we want to live as your people who are coming into the year of Jubilee. We want to experience life more abundantly. We want to be brought out from the things of bondage and, and blindness, from being held in prison, from being sick or infirmed. We want to be, Lord, delivered from all of those things. We want to be healed and set free and established. We want you to restore your image in us. We want you to put your spirit in us and fill us with joy and peace and hope and love and all of the good things that you want to fill us with, Lord. I pray. I pray, Lord, once again. I'm asking you again for Jubilee to come. Make our lives be transformed to the point where it is such a profound change that anyone who sees us knows you are working in our lives. I pray that you will give us reason to sing and praise your name and shout on high about your goodness. Lord, help us to surrender ourselves to you entirely to give you the opportunity to do the work that you want to do to transform our lives. I feel certain that we've gotten in the way so many ways. There's so many times where we've caused our own bondage and our own struggles. But Lord, we need you to be our deliverer. We need you to be our restorer. You are our only hope, but in you, what I'm reading about in Isaiah chapter 61, 
I, I want that for my family, and I want that for the families of this church. So please, Lord, give to us in a way that will make the community around us stand up and wonder what's going on. And then we can testify of your power, your peace, your goodness. I thank you for hearing my prayer. And I'm asking it in the wonderful and mighty name of our Savior, Jesus Christ the righteous. Amen.